Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 through 24. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. No man puts a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up takes from the garment, and the rent or the tear is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runs out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. While he spoke these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him saying, My daughter is even now dead. It, come and lay your hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman, which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be made whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels, as means musicians, and the people making the noise, he said unto them, Give place. Make some room for me, is what he said. For the maid is not dead, but sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn. This morning I want to uh, minister a message that I titled Healing from the Disease, the disease of Discouragement. Wow. You know, in this passage of scripture where it started off, it, it talked about the fact that um, it said, How will the children that are in the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? What he was talking about, you know, Jesus was coming in to institute the new covenant. Many of we have talked about that many times. They were used to the old, living in the old covenant, living in the Old Testament, doing things uh, the way that the old covenant was to be done. It doesn't mean that we don't fast in the new covenant. It doesn't mean that we don't seek the face of God. But it, things were being done differently. See, John the Baptist's disciples, who are the ones that came to Jesus, were fasting and they were preaching a message of repentance so that the people of God, so that the people would come and that they would be baptized of the Lord so that their heart could be softened so that they would be receptive to the king and the message that he was preaching. But what Jesus described was is that in the time frame that he was still with his disciples, he was it was like a marriage was going on. Like a marriage feast. You know, we, we learn from the scriptures in John whenever Jesus performed his first miracle that the Jewish people look very highly on the, the, the ceremony and the sanctity of marriage. And that in many times it would, it would actually would take place over a week's period. And that, uh, that they were feasting and that they were having a good time. And Jesus said, see, right now I'm with them. Right now the bridegroom is here, but there's coming a day when he won't be here. See, right now it's, it's, it's festive. Right now they're, they're, we're in the midst of a feast and there's a time of happiness. But he was foreseeing the day when it wouldn't be that far away. Whenever he would be deceived, when he would be betrayed, when he would be crucified. And his disciples would be, now be separated from him. And they would feel the pain of that separation. And, and listen to me. Whenever you find yourself in the midst of situations and circumstances, even today on this earth. You know what? It's a good thing to seek the face of God. Yes. Sometimes it's a yeah important thing to fast, amen, and to seek the face of God so that we can feel his presence, hear his voice, so that we can give, be given strength and wisdom on to know how to walk, amen, and, and where to go. You know, uh, there's uh, at least three main thoughts in this passage of scripture. And the first one was that, once again, Jesus was having dialogue with these disciples of John the Baptist. And they were wanting to know, why does it look so different? You know, why? Why does it look so different what what we do? So we're John the Baptist disciples. Why does it look so different what we do and even what the Pharisees do uh, compared to what you do? They aren't fasting like we like we fast. Why aren't your disciples fasting? In one of the other gospels, it actually talks about the fact that it was on the Sabbath day and that the disciples, as they walked through a, a field of, of grain, they were actually pulling the grain off and they were eating it. And that was what kind of like instigated them to ask these questions. 
Because also, you know, they were wanting to know, why are your people bearing a burden on the Sabbath? It's almost like they were so religious in their mind that just pulling the grain off the top and getting a little food to eat was like producing a harvest or working in the field. And, and Jesus explained to them that, you know what, that, that the Sabbath wasn't made for the way that you're making it to be. No, the Sabbath is, is a time of rest, but ultimately we've already learned that the Sabbath represents, you know, the rest of God which was ultimately provided through Jesus. And spiritually speaking, it's very important that we understand that. That when we find ourselves in the midst of life and we find ourselves overwhelmed with the things that are going on in life, that you need to understand that there's a rest in God. Amen? Amen. That there's a spiritual place that you can learn to trust. Listen, <laughs> but I've never been there, preacher. I've never experienced what it is that you're talking. But listen, I'm here to tell you this morning, I got good news. There is a place of rest. Yes. And we're going to learn from this story that there's going to be many times and many ways that the enemy will try to distract you and to pull you out from, from putting your faith in the Lord and from learning how to truly rest and to trust in what Jesus Amen. came to give us. Amen? Amen. One of his responses is that you don't put new wine into old wine skin. See, Jesus was talking about the new covenant. That's the first part of this passage I want to talk to you about. Yeah. In those illustrations, he was using them to describe the coming of the new covenant. He said you don't put new wine in old wine skins. He was talking about the new covenant. There was going to be a big difference between the old and the new in that in the new covenant, like new wine in a new wine skin, the Holy Spirit would live on the inside of a new creation. Amen. There's a good word right there. Yes, Listen, God's not into rehab. Look, you don't sew a patch on, on an old garment. See, the patch is new and it's going to shrink. And if you try to sew a, pat, a new patch on an old garment, whenever the new patch shrinks, it's going to tear the garment even more. You can't function in the new covenant the way that they function in the old covenant. You can't have your focal point on living your life according to a set of rules, according to a set of laws. No, instead you, we have to learn how to trust in the Lord and that there's a great change that's take place. Like new wine and new wineskins, the Holy Spirit it comes to live inside a new creation. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. You know, we could go on and on talking about scriptures in the new covenant. And I have a couple more here. But this one really says it all right here. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You know, if each and every one of us in this place this morning would, would begin to think back, Maybe not even that far. I'm just saying, maybe last night, maybe last week, maybe two years ago. I don't really know. That's not my job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But if we would start to think about the things that our old man or our old creation, that person that was born of Adam before he was born again or even in his struggles after he's been born again. Has been living and and, and, and the way that the, the way that we've been approaching life, we would be realize we would realize. Listen, we need to understand and have a revelation of what it means to be a new creation in Christ. I got good news for you. You know, I don't always tell my story anymore, but I was in three rehabs by the time I was nineteen. Wow. They kept trying to rehab me. Uh -huh. right. We need to rehabilitate this boy. Right. He, he's a he's incorrigible to society. But let me tell you something, rehab isn't going to fix it. Yeah. Uh, the psychologist, and you know, I've even changed my mindset on some of this. Because I believe that the psychologist genuinely wants to help people. I believe the counselor genuinely wants to help people. I believe the psychiatrist that writes the medications genuinely wants to help people. But what they're trying to do is kind of like the old covenant. They're trying to do something on the outside. They're trying to make something look better on the outside, but they can never reach into the inside. See what I'm saying? But the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, yeah. through the work of what Jesus did at the cross, allows a change to take place. Yeah. I'm here to tell you, we, everybody may not want it this morning, but God doesn't do rehabilitation. He does recreation. Amen. Behold, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. New wine and a new wine skin. Hallelujah. The Holy Holy Spirit inside a new creation. Now, the second thought is that there's a desperate man in this story. There's a desperate man in this story, and he's trying to get to Jesus. 
His daughter is deathly sick. In actuality, the story says that he died. Uh, but, uh, because he, but he knows, he pushes forward. He's trying to get to Jesus. But I'm going to show you another verse coming up that there's obstacles in the way. There's all kinds of things that are in his way, but he's trying as hard as he can to get to Jesus. He pushes forward because he knows that the only way that his daughter is going to be given life, the only way that she has any hope is if he gets all to Jesus. Yes. Lastly, we're told about a woman who's been plagued with a problem for 12 years. Now, we're going to kind of break it down a little bit. We're going to go a little bit deeper than maybe what we normally would. But it's affecting every facet of her life. She's tried everything she knows to do. Nothing is working. <clears throat> she doesn't know what else to do. So in desperation, she makes a move to touch Jesus. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that it's bigger than just touching him. Whenever we look at, take a look at the word, what it really means is it has a whole lot more meaning than just touch it. But just listen to me. One touch from Jesus. One touch from oh, the yes. master's hand. Yes. Man, I'm telling you right now, I can remember the morning. And I'm not trying to go off into old stories, but I can remember the morning whenever I, the, I'm sorry, the night, whenever I turn on that worship music after tragedy had struck my life. And I can remember just crying out to the Lord because my sister had died. And I just said this one simple word, a life filled with failure before Jesus and after Jesus a life filled with pain because I kept failing the Lord and I can remember in that one moment whenever I went to worship the Lord how the Holy Spirit began to reveal to me my past all the failures of my past but look what he was showing me in my heart was but I'm going to heal it all I'm going to change it all no matter what you've been through no matter how many times you failed me I'm not like a man I'm not going to hold you in condemnation I'm here I've come to set you free I've come to liberate you I paid a high price so that you can be free son and as the Lord was speaking to my heart even though I saw all those failures from the past even though I saw all those times that I had let people down what the Lord was revealing to me was he was was lifting the weight of yes. guilt off of me, yes. amen, and he was doing a work in my heart in one moment of time, yes. amen, <laughs> that, that no man could ever do. We need to grab a hold of that this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. I want you to know, too, that every piece of this passage is extremely important for our lives today because the new covenant offers hope, but so often like the veiled language Jesus spoke with, I mean, I'm just saying, he's, he said, you don't sow a new patch on uh, old pieces of clothing. You don't pour uh, new wine into old wine skin. I mean, couldn't you have been a little bit more clear, Jesus? <laughs> really? You know? And, and, and a lot of times people say, well, the gospel is so simple. But listen to me, it is simple. The gospel is very simple. But there's some aspects of it that Jesus is purposefully hiding in veiled language because you know what a disciple is going to look a disciple is going to search a disciple is going to dig and he's going to be hungry just like this man his name was Jairus of the gospels tell us was hungry to get a hold of Jesus just like this woman was hungry to get a hold of Jesus a true disciple needs to be hungry yeah. to grab a hold of Jesus like the veiled language Jesus spoke with sometimes it's hard to understand sometimes we have trouble understanding what God is really saying in the Bible and can I tell you something? We can't believe what we don't understand. If you don't understand True. it, you can't believe it. True. There are always, this is the next thing, there are always going to be obstacles that stand in our way. Yes. Satan will oppose us every step of the way. That's right. To keep us away from God's will for our lives. What is God's will? That's, uh, that's a question. What is God's will? That no matter what we face in life, the answer is that we need to get to Jesus. Yes. Right. No matter what we face in life, the answer is that we need to get to Jesus. Why is that so important, preacher? Because if you'll get to Jesus, if you'll grab a hold of the hem of his garment, if he'll bring you back from death to life, if he will bring healing to your body, and guess what? Filled with the joy of the Lord, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, it will flow out of you and that same healing that touched your life will begin to spread to other people. That is God's will on this yeah. earth. Hallelujah. That the lost and that, the, and that they might be saved. Yeah. That those that are dead might come to life. That those that are diseased might be healed. That they might stand up and walk in the beauty of the new covenant with the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. That they would become the children of God. Amen. That's a good word right there. It's all. Hey, listen, I'm not trying to say I'm not saying I'm saying it real well. I'm just trying to say it's written real well. That's a good word. That's a beautiful plan. And, and you know what? Let me just say this. 
If you're not bought into this, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I, I didn't come here this morning in a bad mood. I really didn't. I'm not looking to poke nobody in the eyeball or step on anybody's toes today. But if it happens, it happens. Let me just say this. If you have not received a revelation from the Holy Spirit that this life is not all about you and what you want, but that instead it's about God and what God wants, and that your whole purpose on this earth is like a dress rehearsal. A dress rehearsal for eternity. It's all about what are you going to do with the Son, Jesus. Will anybody accept the Son? Is he, is he being proclaimed? Is he being spoken of? What are you going to do with him? It's not what, if you can be the best welder on the earth. It's not if you can be the best nurse practitioner on the earth, the best daddy, the best husband. All those things are important. But it's, will. what are you going to do with Jesus? I'm, I'm firmly convinced of that. That what are we going to do with Jesus? What are we going to do with this gospel that's been placed in our hands? Will the preacher preach it? Will the hearer re submit to it? And what are we going to do? Amen. Because listen to me. If the word of God is truly saying what it's saying, and I know that it is. Then when we breathe our last breath here, we're going to take our first breath there. And then we're going to know. We're going to know, amen, that this whole thing was all about an eternal family. Yes. yes. An eternal decision. Yes, a new covenant. Yes. Well, yes, the Lord temporarily inhabited us as a tabernacle on the earth today so that he could tell others the good news. Amen. But that ultimately it was that we would spend eternity with. Hallelujah. Listen, sometimes even whenever we're on this earth, we're kind of like this, this woman and things aren't going our way. I'm telling you, there's hope for today. Hallelujah. There is hope for today. But, but listen, if we're unwilling to live with the hope of tomorrow and we only live for today, huh. I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to find happiness on That's this good. earth. Amen. You're not going to find happiness on this earth because you're going to be walking to and fro looking for something to fill a void that's not going to be able to fill the void. That's the truth. Lord, help us. That's the truth. Lastly, it's inevitable. So the first thing was that the, the new covenant is relevant to our lives today. Amen. And, there, and number two, that there's always going to be obstacles that stand in the way. We're going to look at that a little closer. Lastly, it's inevitable that we're going to try to remedy our situations another way. And the heart of man is a streak of rebellion that will often fight against total surrender to God's will. But after years of fighting and frustration, surrender to God will bring the peace that we've been longing for. What I'm trying to say is, is that we're going to see in this story that there's always something in us that's trying to remedy the situation another way. Right. Can I get an amen? amen? I'm not speaking to one person in this place this morning. I'm speaking to the whole congregation. Each and every last one of us will try another way because it's the way that we want to go. And so oftentimes we're hard-headed and hard-hearted to go towards the way that the Lord is communicating for us to go. He's speaking to our heart. Our, our, our ears are not deaf unless we've hardened our hearts towards the voice of God. But that's what we often do. We push him down. We suppress the voice of God because many times he speaks to us and he tells us things that we don't always want to hear but then again sometimes we don't even know there's a whole slew of people out there that don't know where to believe what to believe they don't know where to turn because they've never been told help us Lord that we wouldn't want to go our own way but that instead we would want to go your way yes. this is point number one I only have two this morning y'all ready point number one the new covenant offers a new path to hope. The new covenant offers a new path to hope. He said you don't put a new piece of new cloth on an old garment for it's going to tear it worse. You don't put new wine into old wine skins because it's going to break them and it's going to be lost. Jesus uses the example of a new patch and new wine skins that things, and in a way that things won't work to describe the new covenant. Jesus didn't come to earth to patch up an old system. Amen. Amen. His purpose was to bring in something new. He had come to lead a group of people that had been blinded under the rules of Judaism into the kingdom based on him, based on his truth, based on a true righteousness, which wasn't something outward. But instead, it was something that take place inwardly. <laughs> when we try to live according to rules or laws or faith in self-performance, we frustrate the grace of God. Yes. Right, right. Because the grace of God is for people that need God's help. Yeah, I love the, the passage where Jesus said that the well don't need a physician. It's the sick that need a physician. He was referring to the Pharisees 
saying that they were that they were well, what he was really saying was is that they thought they were well. Yeah. You know, anybody that thinks that they're well isn't going to feel like they need a physician. Anybody that thinks, see, they were self-righteous. Right. They were self, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty good old boy. You know, I don't cheat, I don't lie, I don't steal. You know, well, you do something, brothers and sisters, because all of us born of Adam have failed the Lord. Right. All of us born of Adam are, find ourselves guilty in the eyes of God. Thank God for Jesus. That's why we need him. Amen. That's why we need to grab a hold of him. He's the new covenant. He provided a new <clears throat> and a living way. I want you to see this passage in Matthew 26 verses 26 through 28. I'm going to give you three passages of scripture. Well, maybe it's four. Four passages of scripture talking about the new, the, the, old, the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. First thing I want you to see with this passage is that Jesus is the new covenant. Amen? It's him. What is a covenant? A covenant is an agreement. I mean, that's, at its simplest terms, it's an agreement. You know, lawyers still today will even use that terminology. The two parties agree to the covenants herein. It's an agreement. In the Old Testament, there was a sacrifice that would always unify or tie the the two parties together. You know, Jesus is the representative of heaven. Amen? Because God became man. And Jesus is the representative of, on earth. Because he was the son of man. He, was, he came to deliver man from his sickness of sin. And Jesus was the sacrifice that connected us all together. In this passage of scripture, it says, As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave to the disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins. You see, a lot of times whenever you talk to people about, say, the message of the cross, or the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified, or the message of the new covenant, or the gospel, they, they, they think that you... You know, they think that when you're talking about the cross, you're talking about just their initial salvation. And so many times they think that, well, I've already moved past that. I want to get into the stuff about the resurrection. But you'll never experience true resurrection life. You'll never experience new life if you don't understand where to keep your faith. God the Father produced a plan from the beginning of time that ultimately resulted in Jesus having to come to earth, dying on the cross, amen, and because he had no sin, he resurrected from the dead, hallelujah, and now the good news is this, is that when you hear that and you believe that, that same resurrection power that raised him from the dead now will give life to your mortal body that same Holy Spirit will now live on the inside of you that's the new covenant that's the new wine and a new vessel amen he will bring life to you he will give hope to you hallelujah and, and that's who he is that, that's every day believing and trusting in what Jesus did this is the agreement that the father that's the point I'm trying to make this is the agreement that the father has made with mankind Jesus I'm going to send my only begotten son to the earth. He never failed. He never sinned. I'm going to send him to die for you because you can't die for your own sin. Oh, you'll try to fix it in every kind of way you possibly can think of. But everything that you try to do is only like, is only like filthy rags. Your righteousnesses, in other words, your righteous works that you try to use to get towards me will not get you towards me. Only he can get you close to me. He is the new covenant. Amen. Hallelujah. His blood is the shedding of the new covenant. Hallelujah. You have access to God today. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the fulfillment of this promised covenant that God has given us. And it's God's plan to remove our sins so that he can move closer to us. You know, I love themes in the Bible, and I don't have time to get into that right now, but I love the theme of watching how God has been bringing his presence closer and closer to mankind. I love to study those kinds of things. And I'm just telling you here that God has been, I tried to say it to the people in Mexico, but you know what? I can't speak Spanish very well, and I, but I can't even describe it in English. That God who calls those things that aren't as though they are and he creates out of things that are unseen. He just speaks and stuff happens. You understand what I'm saying? But when I read the Bible, I look at this and I'm like, Lord, 
I mean, they would say it like this in Spanish, mucho trabajo, very much work. <laughs> when I look at what God's been doing through the years of human history, very, very, very much work. He's been, I'm talking about when you look at how he's done it, right? And he's, he called a man named Abraham out and through that man he created a nation and the years that it took to get them where he desired to get them and then the way that he pulled them out of Egypt and the way that they wandered for all those years and all along teaching and giving revelation and, try, and, and line upon line and precept upon precept, illuminating his word and giving more and more information to the human race. Why? To prove to them. So that you could go backwards through the pages and you could see his plan working all the time in the course of human history. So that you could see that it didn't just show up out of nowhere one day. That it didn't happen on some dark back alley, but that God was planning it all along to give us Jesus. Amen. And that the work of Jesus would be enough, hallelujah, to set it free. Well, let's look at a couple of scriptures that will prove this point to us. Look at this. Ezekiel 36. 25 through 27. We're talking about this is the old covenant. Now, this is about five, six hundred years before Jesus would be born. And look what the prophet, the Holy Spirit speaks to the prophet. He says, then he's talking about a future time. He's talking, he's talking about the new covenant. He says, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. I got to stop right there because while we were in Mexico, we were in one service and we were teaching the message of the cross. And there was these two guys, they were like Judaizers. It was like the devil brought them in there. They were like Judaizers and they were trying to kind of come in there and cause some conflict. The Lord corrected it. The Lord fixed it. But you know what they were saying? They were saying we weren't worshiping God for real because we weren't worshiping on Saturday, number one. And that cleansing came from being dipped in water. I said, no, sir. And I, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure Gaudi translated it right. That God says that he foreordained a lamb before the foundation of the earth. He didn't foreordain some baptism pool before the foundation of the earth. No, cleansing comes through the blood of a lamb. And let me just make this point to you. If you dig a little bit deeper right here, what you'll learn is, is that we're talking about clean water to bring cleansing was, was had within it the ashes of the red heifer. And I know that I've said it many times. I hope you don't get bored with good, with good teaching that the ashes of the red heifer was a different sacrifice than the other sacrifices. <laughs> See, the other sacrifices, they cut its throat, they collected its blood. In the ashes of the red heifer, they didn't cut it. They didn't drain its blood. They burned the whole animal. So you know what that means? The blood was within the ashes. And whenever they put those ashes in that water, now the water would contain the blood of the sacrifice. And everywhere that it was sprinkled. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that this isn't a type of baptism. This is a type of the cleansing of the Lamb of God. If you go forward and you look at the book of Hebrews, it talks about that. That Moses sprinkled all the articles with blood. He didn't have like a bowl of blood that he was sprinkling. Yes, they did that on the mercy seat, but instead it was with the ashes of a red heifer. The blood contained within the water as cleansing is going forth. He says, and, and so I'm going to sprinkle you with the blood of a sacrifice, and you're going to be clean. From all your filthiness, from all your idols will I cleanse you. Look at this. A new heart will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt like you weren't walking the way God wanted you to walk? And you weren't doing the things that God wanted you to do. Look, God promised hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born that the new covenant would be different. You know what he said? A new heart and a new spirit. Hallelujah. God, God promises, listen, when you get born again, th that's why you felt different when you got born again. You might say, yeah, but I don't feel a whole lot different now, preacher. Well, guess what? You just need to go back where you first started. You need to put your faith back in Jesus. You need to come to the realization that you, that you have wandered and you've, grown, and you've gone out of the way, but that the Lord will bring you back. Amen. The Lord wants to take the stony heart out and he wants to replace it with a heart of flesh because you can't mold a stone. You can't mold a stone. God wants to be the master of our heart. He wants us to hear his voice and he wants us to do his will. Amen. And he put, he does something new to our spirit. Before we get saved, our spirit is dead to the things of God. Mm -hmm. Number two, not only does he change us on the inside, but look at this. 
He moves into our lives. Verse 27, right there, what we just read. He said, I'm going to put my spirit within you. That's a beautiful thing. That's the new covenant right there. Number three, the result of his spirit living in us is that we are given strength to do his will. Look at this. I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and you will do them. When you ever get to the place in your life that you do want to do the will of God and you're willing to walk according to the will of God. Guess what? The Holy Spirit in you will give you the strength that you need in order to accomplish what God wants to do for you. Look at Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. Old Testament passage that speaks of a new covenant. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. Although I was a husband unto them, says the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. In the old covenant, the God's law or his word was written on tablets of stone with the finger of God on the tablets of stone. But in the new covenant, he's saying, I'm going to write my law on the inside of their hearts. Yes. How would God write his law on the inside of people's hearts? Why? Because the very author of the law now lives in your yes. life. Long before you ever, you ever failed God in a way that he didn't want you to fail if he was already speaking to you. Yeah. L listen, before I even, right freshly saved, hadn't even cracked open the Bible, when I got saved that day, the first thing that I thought of when I stepped up off the, off the ground, off my knees, was I, I can't keep doing what I'm doing. All my, my mind was flooded with all the things that I was doing that I wasn't supposed to be doing. Yeah. And immediately the Lord began to reveal to me, all the things that I wasn't supposed to do. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit yes. moved in and yes. began immediately to share with me and to show me. He was in my inward parts. He was writing his law on my heart. Amen. <laughs> Last thing I wanted you to see right here about the new covenant comes out of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 through 20. Having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus... <clears throat> By a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. And this is why it's so important for us to have a revelation of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's always important for us to understand the gruesome nature of the physical sacrifice that Jesus performed. You know why it's important, I think, in my mind for me to remember that? Is to remember the pain that Jesus suffered. To remember what he did, what he had to go through, because it reminds me how much the father loves me yes. because God, the father allowed his son who never failed him once to go through the things that he went through because he loves me that much. But I want you to also know this spiritually, his death provided life for me spiritually his death reconciled me to God. What does that mean? It means I was far away. I was distant from God and God brought me close again. His death brought me close again and allowed the Father to see me as clean and this allowed His Spirit to move in and now I'm right here with God. I wanted to say that it's important that we understand that God is right here with us. That's why Matthew said He is Emmanuel. He, he's God with us. It's important that we understand that He's right here with us and that we're right here with Him. You know why? Because there's going to be times in our lives where the enemy will try to convince us that we are alone. I don't think I can say that loud enough. There's going to be times in our life when the enemy will try to convince us that we are alone. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that he is a liar and he's the father of lies and that you're never alone. Sometimes it feels like you're alone because you're distant. Sometimes it feels like he's not hearing your voice. But no, he's just one call away. And what he's waiting for us to do is to come to the realization of how bad we need him and to call upon him. And he will be he will be more He's more than able and he will be more than willing to rush to your need. Amen. To show up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look, Satan is a master at making people feel discouraged and hopeless. Yes. He has a way of causing us to focus on our circumstances instead of God. And in those moments, he's trying to convince us that God isn't here. Have you ever been low before? I'm just wondering. Have you ever been low before? Have you ever felt down before? Have you ever felt 
hopeless before? Has you been, have you ever been surrounded by darkness? Have you ever felt like you were forsaken by everybody that loved you? Even God, because you can't feel God's presence. I'm here to tell you, God says he will never leave you nor forsake you, but that lying devil is a master at tricking people and deceiving people and making them feel like they're on their own and that they're not going to make it. And I'm here to tell you, no, he's a liar and that Jesus is just one call away. But listen, at the same time, Jesus is wanting us to surrender. He's wanting us to look to him, to trust in him, and to surrender to his will. The enemy wants to convince us that God isn't here. He wants us so discouraged that we believe there's no hope for change. It's always going to be this way. He wants us to believe that it's always going to be this way and nothing's ever going to change. That brings me to point number two. This is my last point. It's a long point, but it's my last one. Discouraged from disease. Look at verse 20 of Matthew. What was it? Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9 verse 20. It says, and behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood for 12 years. 12 years. She was diseased. She was, listen, I, I know she had, she was, the Bible says it, that she was diseased. She was diseased with an issue of blood. She had a menstrual cycle every day for 12 years. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about that because, see, she was diseased with an issue of blood. And when I think about this situation, I can't help but think about the disease of sin. It's more about the similarities to what sin does to us spiritually and what this condition was doing to this woman physically. I want you to understand that. We're going to have to dig a little bit deeper to really understand. It. See, if leprosy can be used to describe one of the best examples of sin in the Old Testament because of its close connection to uncleanness then this woman's condition has to at least be second on the list. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 15, 19 through 31. If you can bear with me as I read this Old Testament passage that most people don't even want to read in the Old Testament because the book of Leviticus is so full of the law and you know people don't understand and make the connections to New Testament spirituality. I'm here to tell you this morning that if for no other reason, and we have the story of this woman with the issue of blood, and for no other reason we have the story in the book of Leviticus and so that we connect the two so that we can see that God brings healing, God brings hope. Look at this, verse 19. We're talking about a woman in the law. That's on her menstrual cycle. Okay, this is, what the, this is what the Word of God says. If a woman has an issue, talking about bleeding, and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days, and whosoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything that she lies upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sits upon shall be unclean. Whosoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whosoever touches anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And if it be on her bed or anything whereon she sits, when she touches it, he shall be unclean until the evening. And if any man lie with her at all and her flowers be upon him, he shall be unclean seven days and all the bed whereon he lies shall be unclean. And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of her of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation, she shall be unclean. Every bed whereon she lies, all the days of her issue shall be unto her as the bed of her separation, and whatsoever she sits upon shall be unclean. As the uncleanness of her separation, and whosoever toucheth those things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. But if she be cleansed, oh, hallelujah. But if she be cleansed of her issue, then she shall number to herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. And on the eighth day, I said, on the eighth day, she shall take unto her two turtle doves or two young pigeons and bring them unto the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for her before the Lord for the issue of her uncleanness. Oh. Thus shall ye separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness that they die not in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. God 
began to explain in the Levitical law the difference between clean animals and unclean animals. The difference between clean states of human beings and unclean states of human beings. Why God chose to say that a menstrual cycle on a woman was an unclean state, I don't have all the answers for you, but I'm just here to tell you that the Lord put it probably just so that we'd have a revelation of the story of this woman that we're going to talk about this morning. Everywhere she went, everything that she touched, unclean, 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 unclean. Go give you a hug in public, now you're unclean and you can't go into the house of the Lord. Everywhere she went, every, everything that she's touching is now unclean. Sin makes us unclean. Whenever we uh, walk our life in sin, it causes separation between us and the presence of God. God said, tell my people that this will make them unclean so that they die not in their defilement. So they die not in their uncleanness. So they bring not their uncleanness into the house of of the living God. God has a plan for cleansing. Hallelujah. And he called it the eighth day. I know I talked about it Wednesday a little bit. And I had no idea that this is where the Lord was going to bring me. But I'm here to tell you there's always hope. Yes. Yes. In the eighth day. Anyone that she would touch would have been unclean. No one would have wanted to be near her if they knew her condition. How often is that not true of self-righteous religious right, folk? Right. Yeah. And they hear the story about somebody and what they've been through and their uncleanness. Oh, I don't want to be around them. I don't want to touch them. Their, their uncleanness might jump off on me. Lord, help us. The Bible teaches us that Jesus ate and meat with sinners. What does that mean? He sat down at the table with them and he ate with them. And the people that he rebuked were the religious of heart. He said, you're like a bunch of whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. You look clean on the outside, but you're full of death on the inside. Right. The heart and the spirit of religion will down judge on other people. Yeah. The heart of Jesus isn't like that. He said, I came to give my life for them. And you're going to condescend and look down on them? No, that's not the will of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How she must have longed for an eighth day. This woman right here that we're talking about in the New Testament. Yeah, good. How she must have longed for an eighth day. So she could bring her two turtle doves or her two pigeons for her sin offering and burnt offering so that her sin could be forgiven. How she must have longed to hear those words, you're forgiven, my child. You've been made clean. You're restored now. You can come to church. You don't have to be ashamed anymore. You can hold your head up, girl. You're clean. But instead, year after year, just kept passing. Every year for 12 years. 50, 52 weeks, however you, Jewish calendar, Gregorian calendar, however you want to count it, a year, uh, 52 weeks a year, and she never had an eighth day. Somewhere around 600 weeks and never had an eighth day. The eighth day is a beautiful day. It's a day of new beginning. It represents forgiveness and new life. It represents a fresh start. It represents the new covenant that Jesus came to bring. See, God created for six days and on the seventh he rested. The seventh day was the last day, and the eighth day was the first day of the new week. Wow. Jesus resurrected on the eighth day of the week because God is perfect, and Jesus was the fulfillment of the rest of the Sabbath, and it was a new covenant. So he resurrected on the eighth day, which is also the first day of a new week. The eighth day represents the first day of a new week. It represents the first day of a new life. Resurrection life. The babies were circumcised on the eighth day after their birth. The first birth in Adam represents the fall of man and his physical birth, but the circumcision on the eighth day represented new life, new birth, relationship with God. But this poor lady for 12 years never felt the freedom of the eighth day. Have you ever had an eighth day experience? A day a time where you were burdened with guilt and felt separated from the presence of God. But then you cried out for the forgiveness of God and he blessed you with the new birth yes, of the eighth day. Yes. Listen to me. Maybe you say, oh, I've already been born again, preacher, but I still feel weighted down. Guess what? You can have an eighth day every day. <laughs> you mean we can learn to walk in, with faith in Christ and we can have an eighth day every day. Because he said his name is Emmanuel and he is God with us. God went through all this mucho trabajo, all this work through the years of human history for this purpose. To get his presence on earth, on this fallen earth, so that he can get his presence back to us. God has a plan and he is committed to his plan. Amen. He's committed to his plan to get his presence to us, to get his presence in us, because he wants to commune with us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 
I need an eighth day, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes it seems like we wait and we wait on that day and it never seems to get here. You ever felt like that before? Some of us are probably saying, man, I feel like that a lot, preacher. <laughs> We have different things going on in our lives and we're trusting God that, that they would show up, right? That we'd fill an eighth day. Sometimes it's not even just that we would fill the eighth day for ourselves. Sometimes that we fill an eighth day for people that we love and people that we care about. It's easy for discouragement to set in when things don't occur in the timing that we're expecting. We want God to show up and to do his thing now. We don't want to wait. We don't have patience. You know, timing was a problem in this story also. Sometimes discouragement settles in because it seems like Jesus will never get here in time for the change to take place. Or I'll never get to Jesus in time for the change to take place. She's not the only one in this story with a timing issue. I talked to you earlier about obstacles. And how the enemy will try to place obstacles in your life. Listen to me. The enemy will use any type of, uh, any type of trap. Any type of obstacle, any type of speed bump that he can put in your life, relationships, desires for material possessions, false doctrine, things, some things that, are, that would be good if, if our focus wasn't on him and taking them off of Jesus. He will use it. Listen to me. The enemy will use any obstacle that he can get in your way to prevent you from getting to Jesus. To prevent you from getting that help that you need to get from Jesus. Yes. Oh, but, you know, I'm just so focused on this. I don't know, whatever. If you're a dude, this pretty girl. If you're a, if you're a girl, this good-looking guy or, or whatever. I'm so focused, man. I got to work, got to work, got to work so I can get this thing that I got my heart set on. Or, or whatever. I'm so focused on, you know, whatever. The next high, the next drop. I don't know. Whatever it is. It's obstacles. Yeah. And we wonder why our eighth day doesn't come. Come on. Help us, Lord. Look at Luke 8.42. Same story. Different passage. We, we see this man's name come to find out this leader where his daughter was sick and died. His name is Jairus. He only had one daughter about 12 years of age and she, she lay a dying. Matthew tells us she died. But as he went, the people thronged him. You know what that means? Like I'm talking about obstacles this morning. Yeah. The crowd was so thick. Yep. <laughs> Jesus was moving, right? And Jairus got a hold of him. He said, my daughter is sick to the point of death. Jesus said, okay. His disciples were with him, but the crowd thronged him. I know you know y'all ever been to a rock and roll concert, but that's what it's like. A crowd that you can't get through. You got to try to push through in order to get where it is that you're going. I'm trying to talk to you about obstacles this morning. Yeah. You, you know better than I do what the obstacles are in your life. I, do I, I mean, I try to spell them out, but we need the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what the obstacles are in our life. Amen. The things that are trying to prevent us from getting to the presence of God. The things that are trying to prevent us from making that connection with Jesus so that we can get our eighth day. The people thronged him. They were on every side and he couldn't move. He couldn't move. He couldn't make it to where he needed to go. Sometimes we perceive something as bad timing. It can become very discouraging to us. And when everything we try only fails, that is discouraging also. Sometimes it's timing. It's not happening as fast as what we want it to. But not only that, there's times in our life that we try to make stuff happen. Sometimes it makes sense to try. You know, I mean, it's the logical thing to do. When you're sick, you go to a doctor. You know, I mean, look, I've, I've been around hyper faith people to the point where I believe in praying first. I do. I mean, unless your brain's going to go, we need to pray on the way to the hospital if your brain's hanging out. Although I have seen one time, I know it's kind of gross. There was a dude that got shot in, in the drive-by. And literally the nurse, I remember her, I, mean, I ain't going to say her name, but she pulled the bandage off. She's like, oh my gosh, look at this. Brain matter on the gauze. Threw it in the, threw it in the garbage. What you going to do? You're going to shove it back up in the hole? Brain matter in the garbage. This dude got up, walked out of that hospital. He came back thanking everyone. What I'm trying to say is, is that I don't care how bad it looks. Right, right. The Lord, amen, can show up and do a work. Amen. <laughs> But many times we're trying to do what seems logical, what seems to be the right thing. And even though we're doing all of these things, nothing seems to happen. Look at this scripture in Luke 8.43. 
This is talking about the woman. The man's having trouble because he's got obstacles in his way. This woman has an issue of blood for 12 years. Look at this. Which had spent all her living upon physicians. Neither could be healed of any. She tried. She tried to do everything that she knew to do. And she, she exhausted everything that she had. She didn't have anything left. But you know what? Sometimes when you ain't got nothing left but Jesus. That's right. Listen to me, child of God. Don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let him put so many obstacles in your way. Don't let him frustrate you so bad with timing that you get to the point that you believe that there's no hope because that's his tactic. He wants to get you alone. He wants to make you lonely. He wants to make you feel as though you've been forgotten about. But I'm here to tell you this morning that that's exactly where the Lord is trying to get each and every one of us to a place where we will be desperate and we will become dependent and the only thing we have left is Jesus. The only thing we have left is hope in Jesus and the more we continue to go in a direction that is going to prove that point to us, the more we refuse to surrender today, the more we're going to get closer and closer to that place of desperation tomorrow. You either belong to him or you don't. And if you belong to him, guess what? He ain't going to forget about you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. Hallelujah. He's going to hold on to you. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know what Jairus looked like in this crowd, but I can envision this woman. The word touch, look at this, man. I love this. this the word touched in the, in, the, in, the, in the original language means this. To fasten one's self to, to adhere to, to cling to. It, it reminds me back when I was a young boy and we played football. I remember one of the first things that my, you know, that the coach would say, this is the football. And this thing is so important. <laughs> and you not only really understand how important this ball is right here. And if you see this ball on the ground, now back in the day, now they, they, they tell you to scoop it up and run. But when you were a lineman back when I was growing up, how dare you try to, that ball was sacred. You don't try to scoop that ball up when it's on the ground. You fall on it, you grab it. You cuddle it, you protect it with every inch of your life. And I can see her eyes scanning the crowd. And I know that this is a bad illustration, but it was like the hem of his garment was like a football. She was focused only on, if I can only grab a hold and cling to and adhere to the hem of his garment. Listen, Jairus might have had trouble getting through the thronging crowd, but that woman was determined. And then everywhere she went, nobody knew it, but everybody she touched, everywhere she went, unclean, unclean, unclean. But hallelujah, today was her eighth day. And she grabbed a hold of the hem of that garment and she clung to it and she adhered to it. I don't know about you, but I need the Lord to get me to a place, spiritually speaking, in my mind and in my heart, where all I want to do is cling to him. All I want to do is adhere to him. And when he gives me my eighth day and I feel the, the, the weight of sin lift off of me, when I feel this thing that's been plaguing me lift it off, and I'm healed from it. I'm telling you, there's nothing else in this life. There's nothing else in this world that will ever convince me that it's worth more than having my Jesus. I just want to cling to him. Hallelujah. I want to adhere to him. I need a revelation of that. I don't know about you. I'm talking to the preacher this morning. I need a revelation of that. That Jesus is everything that I need. I don't care if anybody thinks it looks cool. I don't care if anybody thinks it, it, it's, it's the fashionable thing to do. I could care less what they think. Because you know what? They all need an eighth day. And they may go their whole life without an eighth day. They may very well walk and enter their grave without an eighth day because they thought that the world had something to offer them. And all the world ever did was beat them up, leave them lifeless, leave them hopeless. Lord, help us to be convinced that what we need is you and your eighth day. Hallelujah. Her adhering to Jesus made her whole. That's what the word says. Whole to save, keep safe and sound, to rescue from danger or destruction. She was made whole that day. God made her whole that day, amen. The way we spiritually adhere to Jesus is that he becomes the object of our faith. He becomes our daily focal point. He becomes what we look to and never let go of. In the most discouraging of life situations, we have to learn that he is our hope. He is what we cling to.